<laughs> right. Oh dear, that's exciting. Um, well, morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the um, final uh, random rambling, uh, at least for a little while. There is a lot more to come if I could fit it all in. Um, but I better get going because last time I did run out of time and I had to rush it a bit at the end. So sorry about that. But uh, this morning we are going to follow basically uh, the final ride of Jacob Harris. On May the 26th, 1734, uh, Jacob Harris, who was a uh, peddler from Ditchling, um, mortally wounded and robbed uh, the landlord, Richard Miles, of the Royal Oak on Ditchling Common. He then attacked Richard Miles' daughter, uh, sorry, wife, and their maid uh, with the handle of his knife. He didn't stab them. Um, and in a panic, he rode north, uh, taking the contents of the strong box but leaving behind um, his pony with all the, his goods on it, um, which was a little bit of a clue uh, as to who the murderer was. Um, Jacob Harris had close connections with the local smugglers. So he may have been riding north to meet up with them in Copthorne. Uh, nobody actually knows, but certainly this is the direction he came. Um, he skirted Haywards Heath, rode through uh, Lindfield, um, and then just short of Ardingly. Uh, rather than taking the slightly better, straighter, but more open road, he turned down Hammingdon Lane, um, up through Highbrook, uh, to Vinyl's Cross. At Vinyl's Cross, he could have kept going, he could have kept going north, but he chose to turn west and came over Church Hill, uh, round the S-Bend at Hell Corner, to the Cat. Um, the Cat Inn had a long association with the smugglers. He may have been looking for friends there, uh, he knew the land uh, uh, lord there, so he knew he'd be taken in. But he doesn't appear to have stayed there very long before he set up again. Up North Lane, um, past Old Timbers, over Hilltop, um, and down the other side. Um, passing on his left-hand side, um, four acres, which was a meadow in those days. Four acres uh, belonged to the manor. It was all part of the manor lands, which had just been taken over by Robert Bostock. Um, and it was still part of the manor lands in 1923 when Ursula Ridley presented the grounds to the parish council to be used as a sports field for cricket and football. Uh, the first event there was a cricket match and it was decided that Ursula's three-year-old son, Jasper, uh, would bowl the first ball, which he did. Uh, but unfortunately, age three, he only managed to get the ball a few yards down the wicket. Um, much to his acute embarrassment um, and everybody else's amusement. Um, my father had a bit more luck playing cricket there. So this will be the last mention of my family. Um, but in the late 1940s um, against Southdown Cricket Club, he took five wickets in five balls, um, which has not been done very often. I don't think it's been done in first class cricket. He got about a square inch, quite literally, in the local newspaper, and that was all the coverage he got. Uh, but he was very proud of that, and he carried that newspaper cutting around with him for the rest of his life. Um, but so I promise that's the last mention of my family. There have been a lot of events um, on the recreation ground over the years, uh, including the legendary West Hoathly bullfight. Um, in August 1951, as part of the West Hoathly Festival, um, the bullfight was advertised. It was very well advertised, well in advance, created a lot of publicity, unsurprisingly. Um, there were a lot of complaints to the RSPCA. Um, there was a huge crowd there on the day, um, including a deputation from the RSPCA and journalists from several Fleet Street newspapers who came down to cover this uh, bullfight. Um, Beforehand, some of the local men have been issued with pitchforks so they could protect the crowd um, and keep the ball back. Um, and there were people running around in matador costumes, uh, again, trying to keep the, the large crowds back and keep them safe. And just before six o'clock, uh, a horse box pulled up with Ferdinand the bull in the back, bellowing away and occasionally kicking the sides of the box. And then on six o'clock, uh, they lowered the tailgate and out rushed Ferdinand, uh, which was Tony Cardew and 10 year old Stephen Anita in a homemade bull costume. They then proceeded to chase people around 
with their horns. They were real horns. Uh, they had been taken off the wall of the cat uh, a few days earlier um, until he was dispatched. Most people got the joke, um, but some people do seem to be generally, uh, genuinely upset that it wasn't a real bullfight um, and that they've fallen for this. Uh, uh, though, as the organizer said, who was a man called Peter King, um, if they were gullible enough to believe that there was going to be a real wolf fight in the Sussex village, they didn't deserve to be enlightened. The people who seemed to be most upset were the deputation from the RSPCA, who, um, according to the local newspaper, uh, walked off in high dudgeon. Um, but so, so they kept this secret very well. Um, and it, they had told people it was going to be a real bullfight. Um, and some people obviously believed it. Uh, there was a bit of a giveaway in the event programme, which said six o'clock bullfight, um, 6.15, first aid for spectators. Uh, so um, I think they did rather give it away. But um, I hope that account is correct. It, it does come from the local newspaper, because there may well be at least one person watching this who took part in the bullfight. Um, there are still a few people around the village who do. Um, there have been plenty of other events there since, but I don't think the bullfight has ever quite been topped somehow. But that was all to come, and Jacob Harris just kept riding um, down past Cobwebs, uh, past the forge, which was on the corner of North Lane. Um, there had been a forge on that site since 1556, um, but the one he passed um, was relatively new. That was built in 1654, um, and it would survive for another 300 years. In 1914, it was taken over by George Newnham, um, uh, though shortly after he took it over, uh, he went off to France. Uh, he was in the Royal Horse Artillery as a staff sergeant. He did fight on the Somme. Um, but when he returned, he started to build up the business and they took on a lot of small engineering works. Um, another member of the family ran the garage over the road. Um, so they took on everything that they could just to keep the forge going. Um, but George Newnham was particularly well known for his decorative ironwork. Um, a lot of the ironwork you see around the village today um, is his, um, including the village sign, which he built for the Jubilee in, uh, in 1935. I have one of his hammers. Still, it's seen slightly better days, but if you can read that, it does say TJN, that's uh, George James Newnham. Um, I still use this almost every day, um, so he'd be quite pleased it was still in use. Um, although he probably would be quite upset with the condition it's in. Uh, when he was looking to retire in the early 60s, he could not find anybody to take it on. Uh, nobody was interested. So in 1963, uh, the forge finally closed down. Um, it was taken over by a mouldings factory. They made plastic mouldings for aircraft. I think mostly the plastic uh, trays that went on the back of the seats. And that survived for four years until the building burned down in 1967. And the current house was built four years later. But Jacob Harris just kept riding. Uh, what he would have seen as he turned uh, to the west over and around the Four Acre Meadow was uh, Knaves Acre. Knaves Acre is so called because the land was so steep that it was good for nothing. Um, in the late 1930s, it was bought by Richard and Thelma Allman. Uh, Richard Allman came to the village to write, and he had four novels published, um, starting with this one, which is the property of a gentleman, as opposed to the property of a lady, uh, which is a short story by Ian Fleming. I suspect more people have read the short story by Ian Fleming. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who've read both. Um, it does actually include a character called Newnham, um, which is slightly odd, um, which I'm pretty sure has absolutely nothing to do with George Newnham. Um, so Richard Orman wrote four novels, um, then spent three years in the army during the war in India. Uh, when he returned, he realized that he couldn't make a living um, from the novels, even though they were very well, well received. Uh, the Daily Telegraph, and I should have to quote here, called it an unusually competent first novel. Uh, and the Times Literary Supplement said, he writes admir admirably, if I can say it, with great intelligence and knowledge, but um, not enough to pay the bills, I'm afraid. 
So uh, they set up a chicken farm um, on their land, uh, providing poultry to the local butchers. Before he came to the village, Richard Allman had worked for Wedgwood in uh, Stoke-on-Trent, and he had run the family business called Stone and Smith, uh, which sold uh, high-end ceramics and glassware from a store in Knightsbridge. So it was um, very easy to see why he would take up pottery uh, as a hobby. In 1964, they set up a studio. He was uh, uh, he did his pottery at one end, and Thelma, who was a painter, worked in the other end. Um, and when the chicken farm was forced to close after an outbreak of foul pest, um, they set up the West Hoathly Pottery in 1971. And it was uh, quite successful. They sold to people all over the world. They were, as the saying goes, big in Japan. They sold a lot of ceramics to Japan. Um, they even had coach parties turning up on one occasion. The coach party from Essex turned up and they bought virtually everything in the shop. Um, which caused its own problems because the shop was uh, a wooden weatherboarded affair, which is still there, which stands right on the edge of the valley. And if they got too many people in it, it used to uh, vibrate alarmingly. Um, so they had to limit the number of people who went in at one time. Um, but it survived and the pottery kept going and so it was highly collectible. Um, John Paul Jones, the bass player with Led Zeppelin, uh, was a collector. He bought quite a few pieces uh, when the band were based out at Hammerwood, uh, the other side of East Grinstead. I don't know whether he still got it, um, but I do have a few pieces. Oops, there we go. That is fairly typical, and this shows their so-called leopard glaze, which is the spotted effect. Um, they arrived at that pretty well by accident, um, but they did use it quite a lot, although they could never make it work in red for some reason. It only works in um, green and grey and blue. But uh, West Oathy Pottery is getting hard to find. Um, we do have a few pieces here. Um, and that one, I say, is mine. Uh, so the pottery kept going until 1985 um, when um, Richard Allman was suffering from ill health, um, retired. But it was important here for a while and the bits do turn up occasionally. But Jacob Harris just keep, kept going. Round to the West. The next place he would have come to would have been another one of the pubs, uh, the Three Tons, also known as the Tons or the Butts, all references to barrels. He did not bother to stop there. Um, he knew he would not get a very warm welcome, welcome at the Tons. Um, the landlord, Harry Wood, uh, had bit dealt with the smugglers um, and had good relations with the smugglers until one day when he was out, um, they arrived and started to argue with his wife uh, over money that they said was due to them. Um, after a while, they just snatched her, rode off with her, and she was found the next morning wandering naked um, behind the Black Inn, uh, Black Dog Inn on the other side of the village. Um, so Jacob Harris knew he would not get a warm welcome there. Um, the Three Tons is now Duffel's Holt. Um, the name was changed in the 20th century. Um, in the early 1930s, um, it was lived in for a while by Douglas Fairbanks Jr., uh, Hollywood movie star. Never quite reached the heights of his father, who Douglas Fairbanks Sr., um, and his stepmother, who's Mary Pickford. Uh, they were in their time probably the most famous people in the world, um, really the first of the big movie stars. Um, but his Hollywood career was suffering so in the 1930s, he came to this country and Lee spent a, a summer or two in West Hoathly. Um, about that time, he was getting divorced from Jane, Joan Crawford. So I think that was another reason for coming here. But he spent a lot of his life in this country. He never really went back. Um, and after having a very interesting Second World War, uh, he was highly decorated. Um, he settled here and he died here. Uh, but his connection with the village um, sort of ends in the early 1930s. When Jacob Harris passed the inn, he had another choice to make. He could have turned due north, um, down Smugglers Lane to Grave Time, um, which was known, again, for its connections with the smugglers. On one occasion, they're supposed to have killed a little girl who found one of their stores um, near Grave Time. Um, she is supposed to haunt the woods uh, around Grave Time Manor. 
they dragged her body inside um, and in one of the rooms there is said to be a blood stain on the floor um, but please don't go to graves and start lifting up their carpets looking for it um, I think they get upset about that sort of thing unsurprisingly but Jacob Harris decided to keep going on the slightly better road um, with dark falling he stayed on the road went through great rocks um, by Duckles Farm um, when I spoke about the Canadians earlier on, um, I mentioned that some of them had scratched their initials on the gate of the church in Highbrook. I've been told that they also scratched their initials uh, on the rocks near Duckles Farm. Um, I've never seen it, and uh, with the amount of traffic on that road these days, I'm not sure I want to go and look, um, but apparently there are initials there. But that was to come. So Jacob Harris kept going past Duckles. Um, Duckle is just another local family name. Um, Richard Duckle or Dukel um, appears on the Sussex subsidy rolls in 1327 for the village paying one shilling and fourpence tax. He's one of the few people in the village who was paying tax at that time. So I'm saying Duckle is just a local name. I can remember Duckles being open to the public, the gardens being open to the public for charity in the late 60s and early 70s. So I do remember going around there. At that point, it was owned by Mrs. Craven Moore, who was the widow of Dr. Craven Moore, who ran the first aid party that I mentioned um, uh, during the Second World War. Um, before that, um, it was the Bilsons. Uh, the Bilsons were members of the Fabian Society and they were friends of George Bernard Shaw. We know he came to the village on at least one occasion because he went to uh, one of the Greek plays that Charlotte King staged at Stonelands. Um, the grandson of our first custodian here, uh, R Roger Rothwell, took part in that performance when he was six or seven years old. Um, and after the play, he was taken to meet this man with gray hair and a long white beard um, and he said to Roger, um, young man, your performance was quite dreadful. And this was George Bernard Shaw. And Roger Rothwell never forgot <laughs> the um, criticism from George Bernard Shaw. Before the billing, oh, sorry, uh, the, the Bilson's daughter was married to Miles Mallison, who was the actor who lived in the straits next to the cat that I mentioned right back at the beginning of this. Um, so we're going right round in circles here. Um, so the Bilsons were connected to Mars Mallison. Before the Billings, Stuckles was owned by, well, someone we we'll call Mr. X because he was extremely unpopular in the village and I'm not sure whether he's still got any relatives around. Um, Mr. X um, really did annoy his neighbours, at least in part because he put a bull, um, a real one this time, in one of the fields with a footpath crossing it. Um, it wasn't there for very long because Mr. X was crossing the field himself and got chased by his own bull. Um, so he did take that out quite quickly. Um, in about 1922, 23, the house caught fire um, and all the neighbors turned out to watch as people do. Um, while they were watching, he tried to organize them into a bucket chain so they would put the fire out and not one of them would help him. Um, they just stood around and watched his house burn. This comes from Jasper's, uh, Jasper Ridley's memoirs. He doesn't think that is true. He doesn't think people would just have stood and watched. Um, but as I have said before, Sussex people will not be drove. Uh, they're a stubborn lot on the whole. So uh, it is perfectly possible that they just stood there and watched his house burn. Um, it wasn't completely destroyed. It did survive. But uh, that was a while ago. Okay, I'm being very careful just in case he does have relatives around. Um, and we move on to the final desp destination for Jacob Harris. He probably wasn't heading there, but he did stop um, at Salesfield House. He knew the people there. He knew the stoners. Uh, they had been the previous landlords of the Three Tons, and they were good friends with the smugglers. So he was quite certain that they would look after him. They did take him in, um, they fed him, and they hid him on a ledge up one of the chimneys. 
he must have spent a very uncomfortable night uh, on his ledge. Um, but before dawn, there was a hammering on the door and there were arriving officers um, at the door demanding entrance. He'd left quite a trail as he came north. Uh, they knew he was in the area and they had found um, his horse in the Stoner's stable. And Mr. Stoner wasn't able to explain why the horse was there. But when they searched the house, they found nothing. Um, but cold and hungry, um, they asked for breakfast and they asked for a fire to be lit. Um, the stoners desperately tried to stop them doing this, but one of the men did light a fire, unfortunately choosing the chimney that Jacob Harris was hiding up. Um, and he was overcome by smoke and fell into the fire, quite literally at their feet. Um, they then brushed him off and hauled him off to Horsham Jail. Um, and the next assizes, he was sentenced to be hanged. His body was given to the new landlord of the Royal Oak at Ditchling, and he hung the body on a post on Ditchling Common, uh, where it stayed for quite a few years. Um, Jacob Harris is supposed to haunt Ditchling Common, and also supposed to haunt Salesfield. Um, so he's a busy ghost, if you believe in ghosts. Salesfield was always quite a, a community. Uh, it had, at one point or another, a, a blacksmith, a wheelwright, it had two pubs, it had a windmill, um, it even had um, a cricket pitch. So it means that there were four cricket pitches in the village. Um, the current one uh, at Hook Lane, the North Lane one, the Salesfield one, and there was one at Brook House as well. Or there is one at Brook House as well. Uh, an Australian touring team played there in 1885. So this would have been one of their first touring matches in this country. Um, and in 1906, um, Stevenson Clark, um, the owner, um, laid a new pitch. At that point, a Nottingham, Nottinghamshire Cricket Club uh, were refurbishing Trent Bridge. So Stevenson Clark bought the pitch at Trent Bridge and bought it south and relayed it at Brook House. And as far as I know, it is still there. Um, they made their money, the Clarks, from coal, I think mostly shipping coal. Um, so they did have connections in Nottinghamshire, uh, where the coal fields were. But like I say, there were four cricket pitches in the village at one time or another. Uh, the pubs uh, were the Barley Mow uh, and the Punch Bowl. Uh, the Punch Bowl is no longer in West Oakley, it's now in Turner's Hill. Um, but before they moved the boundary, it was certainly one of the 10 pubs in West Hoathley. Um, Salesfield has always been slightly disputed territory. Uh, even back in the, in the late 13th century, there were disputes. The rector of West Hoathley and the rector of Worth argued for many years over the tithes from Salesfield and to which church the, the parishioner should go to. Um, in 1303, the church commissioners um, decided in favour of the rector of West Hoathley. Um, so it is definitely part of West Hoathley. Uh, the Barley Mow is one of the short-lived pubs first appears in 1841 in the census and had disappeared by 1881 when it had been split into two um, properties. One of the properties was a sweet shop uh, owned by Mrs. Budgeon. Her husband, Ben Budgeon, uh, run, uh, ran the hoop works uh, at Salesfield. The hoop works had started uh, behind um, the White Hart Inn further down the Arving My Road. And after a couple of moves, it ended up opposite uh, the punch bowl, which suited Ben Budgeon very well because he apparently liked to drink, liked to drink or two. Uh, if he'd had a particularly good evening, uh, he would be laid out in the back of the cart that he always travelled around in, with his legs hanging over the back, and his pony would just take him home um, half a mile or so to the barley mow. This apparently infuriated his wife, uh, not just the fact that he arrived home drunk, but because he used to wear out his boots um, as he would drag the heels of his boots along the ground all the way between the two pubs. Um, so they didn't last very long. The hoop works made uh, wooden hoops for barrels and for ships. Um, and um, I think there is still a hoop work cottage, old hoop work cottage um, in Turner's Hill where it stood opposite the punch bowl. I'd say, I think now I've mentioned most of the pubs in the village. Um, I missed out the new inn, which stood opposite the Beacon in West Hoathley. 
uh, and then there was the railway in uh, down in Sharpthorn. Um, but 10 pubs for a village this side was not, size was not unusual. Um, the unusual thing is that the most southerly is the Vinyl's Cross. Uh, there's never been one south of there, um, never been one in Highbrook, as far as we know, um, although there's probably a beer cellar or two down there. These pubs came from the government's efforts to encourage people to drink beer, strangely enough. Um, beer is probably the oldest fermented, fermented drink in the world. It may well go back to Neolithic times. Um, it was particularly um, easy to make in Northern Europe because the cooler temperatures aid the fermentation. It didn't go down so, so well in the South. Um, the Romans famously hated beer, uh, though they did have to drink it. And the earliest recorded um, brewer in this country was a man called Artractus, the brewer, whose name appears on one of the second century wooden tablets found at the Vindolanda Fort uh, by Hadrian's Wall. It isn't surprising that the Romans didn't like Celtic beer because it was full of all sorts of strange herbs. Um, honey was probably the most palatable, palatable thing they put in it. Uh, but they also put in uh, narcotic herbs like deadly nightshade, henbane, uh, or hemlock. Um, so it's hardly surprising the Romans didn't drink it um, unless they were really desperate. Um, hops didn't appear as preservative in beer until the middle of the 12th century. Um, and they first appear in this village in 1608. Um, by 1708, there were 17 people growing hops in the village, uh, though that was only 25 acres, so it was never a major crop here. Um, there is still um, an oast house standing near the church uh, in Highbrook, but other than that, you won't see any remains of hops around here. I'd say beer was very important in this country. It was an important part of the medieval diet. Uh, it contained vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates that they couldn't get anywhere else. Um, but it did lead to problems. And uh, inns were first regulated in this country due to the Ayla House Act of 1552, um, which allowed local authorities to regulate them. By the 18th century, um, the consumption of beer had dropped and had largely been overtaken by consumption of gin. Um, and gin was becoming a major problem. It was first introduced through Holland uh, as a medicine used to treat gout um, and indigestion. Um, but it was cheap and it was plentiful, so plentiful that it said that in parts of Kent, there was so much smuggled gin that they used it to wash their windows uh, because there was more gin around than there was fresh water. Um, it meant that people could get drunk very quickly and they did. Um, and Hogarth's famous print of Gin Lane um, is a slight exaggeration, but it's not a major one. Um, and the central character of that is a woman who so drunk from gin that she dropped her baby. And that is supposed to have been based on um, an actual occurrence um, that was witnessed by Hogarth or one of his friends. So gin was becoming a problem. So people were uh, encouraged to go back to drinking beer. And in 1830, the government introduced the Beer House Act. And anybody who could afford a two guinea license was able to sell beer and cider without paying tax on it. And this led to the uh, appearance of 32,000 new pubs. Um, many of them called the William IV, um, as it was, he was on the throne at the time. Um, so the Barley Mow and several other pubs in, around the village were probably uh, opened at that point after the Beer House Act. Um, this drive to get people to drink beer was so successful um, that by the 1870s it was calculated that every man, woman and child in the country must have been drinking 34 gallons of beer a year, um, and which is 220 odd pints. I did work it out but I can't remember the figure. Um, so there was a lot of it about, and again, it brought problems of drunkenness and um, so the, uh, social misbehavior. And they started to regulate it again. Um, local magistrates were given more power. Um, so small pubs were being closed by that. The rise of industrial brewers forced down the price, so it wasn't worthwhile opening a pub. So many of the pubs disappeared. 
um, in the 1880s. Um, that's when the Bali Mo went, it's when the Black Dog probably went, is when the New Inn went, uh, the Fountain as far as I know, and maybe several others around the village. Most of Southfield these days, it is dominated by the brick water tower. Uh, that was built in 1903. Prior to that, uh, the windmill would have been the main feature. The first windmill was probably built in the 18th century. But in uh, 1815, uh, Henry Stanfield had a small smock mill built right on the uh, top of the hill. It lasted until 1909. It was pulled down in 1909 by a steam traction engine. Um, I don't know why they recorded that it was pulled down by a steam traction engine, but it was. There was one other windmill in the village and several water mills. The other one stood in Highbrook, that was the Hammingdon Mill, uh, on the ridge opposite Salesfield. Uh, that was fairly short lived built in 1830 and in 1844 it was moved. It was taken down to New Haven uh, where their mill had burnt down. Mills burning was um, sort of quite common. Um, it was often, as in the case of the New Haven one, caused by a heat buildup uh, on the millstones um, due to a lack of grain. Um, so theirs had burnt down so they moved the, the uh, Hamden mill. Didn't stay there for very long uh, they built a new steam powered mill. Um, so the mill was moved again, taken to Chaley, where it still stands. Um, it's either called Founders Mill or um, Beards Mill. It suffered a lot of damage from storms over the years, um, but it survives. It's still there. You can still go and visit that one. It was moved um, on the back of a cart, and the cart was pulled by a team of bullocks which does seem to have been something of a recurring theme today. Uh, so I think at that point, I better stop. And thank you very much for listening to me, both today and for all of these other talks. They've been good fun to do. Um, and I've had to relearn an awful lot, checking up all my facts. So it's been very good for me to do them. But thank you for listening. On Thursday, the house should open again to the public. So please do come and see me. Uh, but Please not all at once. But thank you again and do take care. Um, bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you.